Well, there we go. We have water and we have a car. Unfortunately, you can't really go into the water when you have a car, so you need a boat and a car if you love both boats and cars. And this far, it's been sort of a problem. When you've been making amphibious cars, it's been, you know, they've been slow on land and they've been bad in the water up until now. Let me present to you the water car. Hi, I'm uh, Fred Selby. We're at Water Car in Fountain Valley, California. It's been our mission to create the world's fastest amphibious vehicle. The vehicle is capable of 45 mile an hour on the water and over 100 mile an hour on land. The water car story goes back 13 years and really uh, our founder and uh, the lead engineer, lead financier on this company is David March and perhaps he had too much time on his hands at that point. The storyboard kind of tells the pictorially the history of water car and it really starts back here in 2001 where Dave March and his son restored this amphicar and you can see they went through the process loved it great father and son project turned the blue car into yellow drove it into the water had a great fun driving it into the water and then that uh, was just boring at that point uh, Amphicars do roughly six miles an hour in the water, not very maneuverable, the steering is via the front wheels, although there's a, a great following for them around the world and they were relatively successful in the 60s. So uh, it, while it gave the, the impetus to create an amphibious vehicle, it, it really drove, let's put some speed into an amphibious vehicle. So Dave started with the idea, why not do it with a Camaro? Uh, started with a fiberglass body and actually this was built in Dave's basement and ended up in a fairly attractive car and this uh, this is out at Lake Havasu on a uh, holiday weekend uh, you can see a picture where are we here we're pulling a, a wakeboarder down here so had a lot of power uh, it did right around 50 miles an hour tremendous amount of attention but the real problem with it was is is Camaros are sleek they're built low to the ground. This one was no exception to that. Uh, but really, to, use, to make an amphibious car viable, it needs to be able to launch itself into the water from, from sand. You don't always have a, a launch ramp available. So that means you gotta have a, a higher ground clearance. And to have put an eight inch ground clearance underneath a Camaro, it would have looked extremely strange. So, and we said, let's try a, a, a different vehicle so we, so we chose this body shape and put a, a Chevy V8 in it. And this water car is really 15 feet long. So a boat running at 60 miles an hour is 15 foot long. It can be quite a handful to operate unless you're pretty skilled with boating. So we felt, gee, that's really not safe. So the next generation was this vehicle. And this is a little over 20 feet long. And we put a variety of General Motor V8 engines in it, all the way up to an LS6, which is about uh, 550, 600 horsepower. Uh, we used this vehicle to set the Guinness speed record for amphibious uh, vehicles. And we've done uh, the Guinness record that we established there was 61 miles an hour in the water. It was a success from an engineering perspective but from a commercial perspective, is really just too big. So, so let's go back to earlier days and let's use this body shape, but instead of putting a high speed motor in it, let's use a little lower horsepower, smaller engine in there. So we, we started off with Subarus and ultimately ended up with Honda and we have a Honda 3.7 liter engine that powers these. So a top speed's 45, 46 miles an hour in the water. And honestly on land, it will do whatever you want to drive it at. You know, I, these are recreational vehicles and I think that's important to keep in mind. They're not, 
they really weren't designed with the intention of replacing your daily driver out there. This is something you use on a weekend, have a good time. So this is really where a water car begins. I guess there's two parts of it. There's the chassis, which this represents, and then there's the hull. So let's start with the chassis, and the chassis ultimately will get embedded in the hull and they become one. So in order to become a high-speed amphibious vehicle, you have to get the wheels and tires out of the water. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they create the drag and you can never, you can never get over uh, about eight or nine miles an hour. And the transition from land to water is very simple. There's really three steps. We're driving down the freeway. We see a, a patch of water that we'd uh, like to enter. We turn, let's assume it's a beach or maybe there's a boat launch ramp. You drive right into the water, just exactly the same as if you were driving down the highway. Once you get into the water, you shift into neutral because you don't want the rear wheels turning anymore. You throw these two switches, which will raise the wheels automatically for you. And while you're doing it, you engage the jet. You do those three things and you're off and running. We try and use off-the-shelf production product wherever possible. I mean, we can't go get a hull, obviously, but we can get a steering wheel, we can get a shift lever, we can get, uh, we can get the glass for the windshield. We can get most of these parts off the shelf. So our challenge as a small company is not to see how much of the car we can build and engineer ourselves. Come on in, this is where it really begins. Our real challenge is, how much that's publicly available can we find to solve the, the problems that we have? This is a fiberglass mold. And come on over here, maybe we can see it better. Inside this mold, you see the chassis. So we've already started laying the fiberglass hull out and we've taken the chassis, it's a chrome molly chassis, and we've put it in and embedded it in the fiberglass. So we'll, one hull, a one piece hull, we don't make different pieces of it and then bond them together like some boat builders do. This will be a single hull, all the way, all the way up to the windshield carrier, the wheel wells, everything, all one piece. The easy approach would be if you could buy a production vehicle and somehow seal it up and put some sort of marine propulsion system in there. That'd be an that would be a quick solution to it, but it really isn't that easy. There just way too many compromises to to be made and we may take the hull for granted we've probably got five years alone in the hull development trying to get a hull that would perform with four large wheel openings for the tires in the body is really an incredible challenge so it really it's probably more about the hull than it is what you see the hull is what you don't see down underneath but that's what makes it all possible. The hull, the openings, how we handle axles going through it and waterproof it, et cetera. What you see above the waterline is pretty simple and straightforward. And I think that's where our mind was when we started down this road was, well, we're just kind of converting a car, but it's, it's so much more than that. One of the tremendous engineering challenges with an amphibious vehicle is how do you cool it on the road? And the only way you can do it is to suck significant amount of air into the engine bay through a radiator and then exhaust it. So that's what we do here. This is our intake side. This is our exhaust side. So inside, what we have really, this is the air plenum. The radiator sits underneath it. And then there are a series of fans even underneath that, which suck the air through the intake, through the radiator, distribute it around the engine, and then exhaust it over here. In the water, it's much easier. We just take seawater in, uh, run it through a heat exchanger, okay, and then exhaust the water right back into the body of water. Come 
on. This is uh, this is hall number one, and we're just beginning to prepare it for paint. So pretty stripped out. There's no interior in it yet. Uh, preparing the surfaces for paint. Hopefully this will get painted in a week or so. Uh, the owner was in last week, yesterday actually, and I picked out what the interior would look like. He wants it to match his Bentley, uh, and it will. People who see one of these and want it, they want it and they want it today, really. So our greatest challenge is to tell people, well, you know, we'll take your deposit, but we can't deliver a car to you for 16 months or so. Now, we, we hope to bring that down dramatically as our production scales. But, uh, you know, this is not a vehicle that most people buy because they absolutely need it. However, there is a market that needs it that lives on islands and, you know, works 80 miles away and if they had a car like this the trip would be four miles. I mean I hear from people like that all the time but most of our buyers today quite honestly buy it because they want it, buy it because it's unique, buy it because it's a toy and our customers are really all over the globe. What did we really want to do? We wanted, it was the goal of doing something that no one else had achieved maybe challenge technology and put your name behind something that hasn't been done before. So with that, we, gosh, we, we got a lot more wrong than we got right over the last 13 years. But as we progress further, each step opened up more and more challenges to it. So, you know, I, I, I never kept track of the number of engineering hurdles we had to overcome. We have 27 patents on the vehicle, uh, but it was like take one step forward and two steps back.